This is 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Uh, so when I was, this was junior year of high school, I remember preparing for the SATs. And I'm sure, I'm sure most of this, if not all, is online now, but I remember when I was getting ready for the SATs, we had this giant fat book. Uh, and as some of you probably remember, some of you might, I don't know, might still have these. They would put out one of these every year. It was this enormous book, SAT prep book, and it was supposed to, most of it was questions, like sample questions, sample tests, to get ready for the SAT. Uh, and it was supposed to sample for you, this is what the test will look like when you go through and take it. Uh, and then there was some other stuff in it. There was like some test-taking tips and strategies. One, I still remember, I don't know if it's the case anymore, but at the time, I remember if it was, you know, multiple choice, if you couldn't reduce it at all, right, if you couldn't uh, narrow down your options at all, you were better off point-wise if you left it blank than trying to guess wrong. So that, that was one tip. And there was stuff like that that I think was helpful. It, it helped somewhat getting ready. But I also remember that year, right, as the test <clears throat> was approaching, I just started hearing all, all of these SAT tutors, right, all of these preparation programs, and there were like these underground services that you could take or subscribe to, and a lot of these would promise, they would promise you know, if you pay X amount, right, we, we promise your score will go up 300, 400 points. And I remember a number of my friends were, were you know, buying into that or they were, they were enrolling in those things. But then, you know, it was interesting. Right? Uh, we, we all took the test, right? Pretty much everybody took the test. And you, you talk about it afterward. And if someone was willing to share how they did, willing to share you know, what their score was, it was pretty much always what you expected <laughs> based on like what you knew about them as a student. Is that, that was really the point of the test, right? that the way you prepared for the SAT was the last 17 years of life. <laughs> what, what have you been doing? Have you been paying attention? Have you been doing your homework? Do you study? Do you invest yourself in doing school well. And, and that was kind of what it was supposed to be testing. And, you know, there's actually a lot of things in life that work that way. You know, you, you think about whether it's, you know, finances or, you know, trying to be really good at a particular skill or hobby. <clears throat> and people are always looking for what's this, you know, is there some kind of method or hack, right, that's going to leapfrog me ahead of everybody else. In reality, you know, there, there is, with all of these fields, the way you are successful in pretty much all of them, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. It's just very hard. <laughs> it's called a lot of commitment over a really long time. And that's, you know, how you, you move towards something. That's how life works. That's really what John is trying to teach us in this passage about being a Christian. Right? What it means to pursue growth in your spiritual life. Uh, and it's, it's quite simple. So uh, this is 1 John 2, 18 to 29. I'm going to read this passage for us. And you can follow along. It'll be on the screens too. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, 
He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children... Abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. There's a lot here, but John's main point is very simple. It's very straightforward. Stick with Jesus and his word and keep doing what's right. Stick with Jesus and his word. Keep doing what's right. I've got four points for us today, and the first one is context. What is the context that's happening here in the church that John is responding to? And you, you can hear that there is one. Second one is the litmus test, which is Jesus as the Christ. Uh, And then we're going to talk about this anointing. There's an anointing, John says, that you have as a Christian. And then lastly, we're going to talk about why and how do you stick with Jesus. So, uh, first of all, the context. What is happening? What's going on in the church at large that John is responding to? There is a backdrop here. You, You can sense that. And you can piece together some of what must have been happening based on what John is writing in order to help Christians at this juncture. All right, so you hear this in verse 19. He says, or he writes, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So clearly, John, the issue that John is addressing here is previously professing Christians who have walked away. They have deconverted. And this is always a bit unsettling. If you see this or somebody you know has been professing the faith and, and they leave, but you've got to imagine here uh, the, the church is only maybe a few decades old, and they are watching people uh, who, who seem very clearly to be Christians, and they're leaving. They're walking away, or at least they are now moving, shifting to a version of Christianity that, has, that looks nothing like what Jesus and, and the apostles have taught. And, and so they're wondering, what is happening? What's going on? I thought it was the case, you know, once saved, always saved. And John actually said, in his gospel, John records Jesus saying almost exactly that. This is what Jesus says. This is John chapter 10, 28 to 29. Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So this is an important teaching of Christianity. That if you are saved, if if God saves you, if you belong to him, he will never, never let you go. He's got you. But what John is saying here, and what's happening, it doesn't contradict that. 
what he is talking about is he, he's talking about observing reality from our perspective. Because you and I don't get the list, in case you're wondering. We don't know who's saved and who's not saved. Who, who, who's, who did God do this work in? And frankly, that's a really good thing. But John is telling us here in this passage, when someone goes out, when they renounce the faith, and they walk away, they start living with no regard to God and his rules, and they never come back, that's your sign that it was never real. Because God is telling us, Jesus tells you very clearly, if he really has done a saving work in someone's life, they won't be able to walk away. God won't allow that. He will keep drawing them back. Look, I want to recognize that there is some mystery here from our perspective. But good news is, practically speaking, it doesn't really matter. (laughs) It doesn't really affect the way you and I live day to day, except insofar as don't be surprised. Don't don't be surprised when things like this happen. When somebody looks like they're they're walking away, when somebody deconverts, which for the record, deconversion, it's not really a great word for what has actually happened. What has happened, you know, this sort of situation goes on in somebody's life. What's happened is that there's an outer shell. There's a form, there's a cultural habit. Uh, there's a deeply ingrained culture of Christianity. So much of the person really believes it's, it's real, but it's not. There's never been a real saving work in, in, in faith in Christ. That's never happened. And what you can see from, from this passage in John, look, this has always been happening. Since the very beginning of the church, there are people walking away, abandoning the faith, who looked like they were all in. So, so this has always been going on. And I, I think one of the reasons why God allows for this kind of thing to happen is that you and I don't take our faith for granted. Faith is a gift, It is a gift from God. It's not a matter of human will or exertion. And so for that reason, because it's a gift, you got to be all in. Out of of gratitude, out of uh, just amazement at this gift, you've got to stick with God and hold on to him your whole life. And if you understand that, you will. So let's go on to the litmus test that John uses. It's very simple. He gives it to us in verse 22. He says, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. So again, I think we can infer some context of what's happening that there are so-called professing Christians who are leaving the church in its original form, but they, at least some of them, it sounds like, are still trying to say, they're still trying to reserve some space for Jesus. And say, yeah, you know, he's, he's within this belief system that I have, but it's just not, he's just not the Christ, which, by the way, that literally means the Christ anointed one, the Messiah, the one Savior that all Israel, all humanity has been needing. Right? And so maybe for these people, maybe Jesus was, you know, he was a prophet. He was perhaps a, a good teacher. He had some good thoughts, but it's just, he's just not the only way to God and eternal life. Hopefully you can hear uh, many, perhaps maybe pretty much all, of the spiritual beliefs that people in our world hold. I don't think you're going to encounter very many people in this world who don't believe that Jesus was a real human being. Or even for for that matter, who don't have some level of respect and reverence for this guy, Jesus. The question is, Is Jesus the 
Christ. It's actually amazing. It's, a, it's amazing how beautifully simple that one question is as a litmus test. And a litmus test, you know, just I'm sure most of you remember seventh, eighth grade chemistry, right? But uh, just refresh your memory. And so we're all on the same page uh, about a litmus test, because that's, by the way, that's exactly how John is using this. This issue of Jesus as the Christ is a litmus test. So litmus test, at least for me, maybe it's changed, there was this little strip of paper, all right, and it was, it was always like beige or tan, and you had your little glass of liquid, right, and you take the paper, you dip it in the liquid, and if it turns blue, it's a base. If it turns red, it's an acid. And I think the only thing where it wouldn't change color, if it's like pure water, it would, then it's, that's neutral. And so, in the case of this passage, or that we just read, the, the contents of the liquid are your beliefs about Jesus. And, and the little strip of litmus paper is the question, is Jesus the Christ? Is he the Savior and Lord of all humanity, including you, the only one. <laughs> and you've you just got to go one way or the other on this. If you try to stay neutral, that is an answer. Right? And so like when you, when you press just this particular question, Jesus as the Christ, everybody's got to move. Everybody's got to make a decision. That you, there's no hiding on that particular question. You've you got to drop down one way or the other. And really, this is the one question, the one question all of Christianity is about. Because if you believe that, that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, it, it will change your entire life. Just that. But if you don't really believe that, well, you are going to base your life on something else. It's really as simple as that. And I would say that John also brings another teaching here that is very useful in demystifying this idea of the Antichrist. You know, because a number of times, or in, and I'm sure this will happen more in the future, you'll hear people talking about uh, you know, this particular celebrity or this politician is the Antichrist. And, and what John is saying here is, like, look, the Antichrist isn't just some, like, really, really bad person, right? just particularly evil. Uh, the Antichrist is an idea. And the idea is anti-Christ. That's it. <laughs> Meaning... Uh, anyone who denies Jesus is the Christ is anti-Christ. And so John is saying to us here that the world has always been, is, will always be full of antichrist. So we don't need to get worked up over, you know, does one particular person embody the antichrist? Yeah, and I remember when I was in grade school, this happened a number of different occasions. I'm sure my parents gave me some of these. I'm sure Sunday school teachers did. Maybe you remember some of these. I got these little charts. It was like a spreadsheet, and it was a comparative world religions. And they would list all the different world religions and sometimes you know, some of the, the main Christian cults. And... Uh, you know, there was columns and rows, and let's say you had the columns were all the different world religions. And then the rows, it was somewhere like four to eight questions that were like the big questions. You know, like, well, who is God, or how was the world created, what happens after death, those kind of things. But there was one question that all of them had, it was always the easiest one to track. Jesus. But what do they believe about Jesus. And, and none of them, not a single one of them, would say what 
Apostle Creed Christian believers have been saying for thousands of years, which is really not that much. It's, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, Jesus is fully man and fully God. Uh, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for your sins. He was resurrected. And the only way you get to heaven is by believing Jesus died for your sins. That's it, really. But none of them would say that. None of them would, would be able to come to all of those different things. And so, again, that, that, that pressing that home, that question, it, it will really clarify, and it's a great way of just cutting through all of the noise. Or what's really important? And, uh, by the way, I would, I would commend to you that this isn't just the case for thinking about other religions. This is, this is the case in a good way to think about churches, Right? And as, you're, as you're looking at, at churches, you're looking to, to grow spiritually. And, and you know, almost all of you at some point will be at a place where you're looking for a church. All right? And so that's a really good, simple question to, to just ask as you're, you're going through and experiencing churches or, or um, spiritual teaching. What's being said about Jesus? Because, you know, if you hear a lot, a whole lot said about various cultural issues and political issues uh, or, you know, how to uh, manage your life better, how to have a better marriage, how to improve your finances, how you can have better mental health. Look, you know, all of these things are important. But if they're not talking about Jesus... If they're not driving towards Jesus as Savior of sinners, you really don't need to waste your time. You can you watch inspirational YouTube videos at home. You join a support group. It's going to get you the same kinds of stuff, right? Because it's it's primarily a man-made product. And this brings me to the next point, which is the anointing, the anointing that you have as a Christian. And, and John is really talking about the ability that you have as a Christian to discern truth. He brings us up two times. It's verse 20 and verse 27. So this is verse 20. He says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. And in verse 27, he says, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. So the anointing that he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit. But you can, you can hear both times he's talking about this anointing of the Spirit, this having of the Holy Spirit, and he is connecting it with your ability to discern truth. Your ability to figure out what's right and what's wrong without needing anybody else. So, don't need to go to church, right? <laughs> is, that, is that what he's saying? You don't, don't need to listen to, to preaching or, or biblical uh, teaching? Uh, no, I think that's fairly contradictory. John is writing as a Bible teacher <laughs> to help teach people, so I don't think that's his point. I think John is trying to say something that's been summed up very well by, by one of my favorite preachers, Alistair Begg. And uh, he'll, he'll say this again and again, his preaching, that when you come to the Bible, the main things are the plain things. And the plain things are the main things. In other words, you can read and understand the Bible for yourself. That's actually one of the key teachings of the Bible about itself, that it's comprehensible, it is accessible. The Bible is not a mystery book. It's not like this, you know, thousand-piece 3D jigsaw puzzle. It's going to take you two hours to get, like, two pieces together. It's plain. It's plain. And the things that are most important 
about the teachings of Christianity. They are just, they are so clearly, they are so repeatedly taught that anyone with the smallest common sense can figure this out, can learn what it has to say. And we, we don't know all the details of what's happening here at, at John's time within the church, but you can kind of piece together. Right? You, you, you can kind of perceive what's happening. And, and that is that there are some, some false teachers who are beginning to cue in, huh, I think people might be getting a little bit tired, a little bit bored of this same old gospel, Jesus is the Savior. Uh, so, so they're saying, look, I've got something new. I've got some kind of new teaching, some new knowledge that, that will take you beyond the basics, but you've got to come follow me. All right, so listen closely. <laughs> Whenever someone tells you that they, and they alone, have some kind of special teaching that you can't figure out by yourself just by reading the Bible, run. (laughs) Just run. It's there. It is all there for you. There is nothing. There is nothing that God wants for you to know that, that you need to know about the Bible, in the Bible, that that you can't learn if you are willing to just go slow enough or take long enough reading and praying over the Bible itself, right? Because it's it's there. And and so I would also say that this, this this would lead us to understand if you hear some kind of teacher or some group who says, in a, in a fairly large area, hey, this is something that, you know, uh, the church has by and large been getting wrong for the last 1,900, 2,000 years. But don't worry, we're, we've got it sorted now. We're, we're on a good track. <laughs> not a good sign. <laughs> uh, Christianity is not an evolving truth. You, you can grow deeper in your faith you can gain more insights about the Bible, but the insights, the new insights that you get, they should always accord with, they should always line up with the plain, old, same truths that have just they've always been there. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will work like a, one of those bomb-sniffing, drug-sniffing kind of dogs, okay? Uh, because this is how it happens. Or you, you, let's say you believe in Jesus. He's the Christ. Jesus is my Savior and Lord. I'm, I'm holding on to this. Right? You, you hold on to that. The Holy Spirit will help you discern all of the rest. Now, that's not to say don't go and find good biblical teaching, but it's to say the Holy Spirit will help you sniff out bad teaching. Because you you should be asking always the question of, you know, does, does this knowledge, does this teaching line up with, is it on a trajectory that takes me to Jesus as the Christ? Jesus as Savior and Lord. Is that what it's about? Or... Is this mostly trying to get me to be concerned about politics? Is this, is this mostly trying to get me to, to give money? Or, or to be loyal to this particular leader or church? And so this, this anointing that you have of the Holy Spirit will sniff out whether it's, it's bringing you to Jesus. And that's why John says it's his anointing that teaches you about everything. It's not like you just shut off your brain and you know, the Holy Spirit zaps you with some knowledge. It's that as you, you live with the Holy Spirit, He is your guide as you read the Bible, as you listen to preaching and teaching. And so what John is saying to you is, 
abide. Abide. Stay with Jesus. Stay on this rock. Don't, don't get shifted. Don't wander off. Don't get, don't get drawn away. Yeah, and, and something interesting that you, you will discover, you know, if you, if you just observe for long enough, is that a, a lot of times people who are less educated, just they're simpler, have a, they do much better with this. They do much better and, and, and can gain much more depth and wisdom just holding on to these plain, simple truths about Jesus. Because one of the things, one of the main things that false teaching does is it appeals to your intellectual pride. It, it will say, hey, look, you know, here, here's a piece of knowledge. Uh, here's some new discovery. Here's some, some new factoid right, that, I, you know, just... It's just above everybody else. That's why everyone else hasn't discovered it. It's too complex. They can't get that. But you and I, we are sophisticated. Right? We know. Right? We can handle that level of truth. That's not what the Bible says about itself. Let me finish now by talking about why and how you abide very briefly. So why should you stick with Jesus? Why should you stick with this just simple gospel of Jesus as your Savior and Lord? And and there's reasons. John says, verse 25, this is the promise He, Jesus, made to us. Eternal life. So those are the stakes. Nothing less. Eternal life. Jesus as the Christ is not like some small ancillary detail. You know, maybe you and I disagree about this, but you look, as long as, you're, as long as you're doing good things, as long as you're treating other people with respect, now you're, you're good. Like, no, j- eternal life is a promise that Jesus makes for himself. And he makes it clear that no one else can give you that. And so we've got to abide in that truth. And and we'll find an accompanying motivation in verse 28. John says, Little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. John is reminding us, Jesus is coming again. And if you die before he comes again, you will meet Jesus. How are you going to feel at that encounter? Are, are you going to be excited? Are you going to be eager? Right? Not, not because you have lived such a good life, but, but because you have held on. You've, just, you've held on to Jesus and Him alone as your salvation. Right? And John, is, he's trying to bring before our mind that encounter. It's going to happen as the motivation to, to just abide, just stick with Jesus. All right, so last question. How? How do you abide? What should you be doing now? What should you be doing today? And John comes to this, uh, verse 29, the last verse. He says, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. In other words, this is how you should be living right now, just, just practicing righteousness, just doing what's right you know, instead of running after some new piece of knowledge, some new insight that's going to you know, finally just vault you to the next level, just stick with Jesus and do what's right. It's pretty simple. Chances are you know exactly what you should be doing today. It's not actually a big mystery. And, and what God wants for us is to just not get distracted. Not get distracted by, by this or that. It's gonna, you know, this is going to get me what I finally need, but just, 
Just stick with Jesus, hold on to him, do what he's calling you to do. And God will be with you, he will bless that. So let's pray that we would have the steadfastness in that. Lord, we thank you that you are not a mystery book. You're not some abstract piece of art that we just look at and look at and and are supposed to come up with our own interpretation. Uh, You are clear. You are plain. You want to be known. And and you, uh, you abundantly bless us through your word by, from every conceivable angle, telling us the most important things that we need to know. I pray that you would just root us deeply in that. Give us a confidence that comes from your truth, from who you are, from your sufficiency, that you, you are enough, that you are, in fact, everything that we need. Uh, and, and to give us hope in that as, as we look forward to you, that we would have a looking forward to this day that we will meet you and just know that, that you have held on to us and we have held on to you. In Jesus' name, amen.